the fog might just stay with me the most. That first image, standing in the disgusting bathroom, wiping the hours of driving off your face, eyes like piss holes in the snow, and then, the fog. One of the most memorable things about Silent Hill 2 is all the things you don't see, at least not until they suddenly pop out at you. One second you're lost in a sea of grey, and the next you're so close you can pick out individual chips of paint on the walls. What even is this place? Just how did things get like this? That's one of the key parts of Silent Hill. You basically never know anything. The answers are all unclear. In Silent Hill there isn't even the suggestion of a world that exists outside of Silent Hill. For all we know, this may be all that's left. What with the abandoned town and all those horrifying creations walking about, the game can't help but feel a little post-apocalyptic at times. It wouldn't take much rejigging for something like this to be in Fallout. But no, there's something else. You can never be entirely sure of what it is, but it's more than just an abandoned town. It's a place that reaches right into your very soul. It's Quato with a dry ice machine and a massive spear that's heading directly to your skull. And once you've paid a visit, you're never going to forget it. It's Silent Hill. To be more specific, this is Silent Hill 2, a 2001 game by Konami from the PS2. The original from 1999 set the scene and stuck you in the shoes of a character who was searching for someone. This sequel also sticks you in the shoes of another character who is also searching for someone. It even uses the same bloody town. <laughs> How lazy is that, huh? Who are you? Well, you're James Sunderland. You're in your thirties and, well, you're basically a normal guy. Up until a couple of years ago, you were happily married to Mary. There were good times and bad, but you had fun together and you used to go on holiday here. This was your special place. But then, Mary got sick. She tried to hide it as best she could, but it was too serious, it became too much of a burden on the relationship, and the doctors couldn't do anything but keep her comfortable until she passed. And so life, such as it was, came to a stop. Travelling without moving, to use a completely unnecessary Jamiroquai reference. Until a couple of days ago, when you received a letter, from Mary, talking about how she's here, how you'd always promised to take her back, but never could. And now, she's in that special place, waiting for you. And you? Well, you never quite got over what happened, did you? There was always that big hole where Mary used to be. It seems fantastical. It couldn't possibly be real. Could it? Either way, you have to know. And so, James, that's why you're here in Silent Hill. James is quite special as a character, mainly due to his mundanity. Like a lot of survival horror protagonists, he's not especially skilled when it comes to things like, say, combat. Usually he's much better off just running. That's how I always saw it anyway. I'm in this strange town and all these creatures are after me. Hell no, I'm not going to fight. This is about survival, and I'll be a lot better off if I don't try to engage them. They're horrifying enough as it is without me getting up close and personal. But yes, his normalcy is kind of startling. You get so used to casually describing video game characters and how proficient they are at just about everything, even the most normal ones are experts at something, that someone like James is, well, a strange world. Who am I playing as? A fairly depressed man, regular build, gets out of breath when he runs too much, can swing a plank of wood about but not much else, always tries to act as a calming figure in conversations, never one to actually stick his neck out or boldly state an opinion. His passivity, particularly when dealing with the few other people he finds within the town, is startling, and it completely changed the way I would play the game. But as the story goes on, things do change. As they change with James, they change with you too, and in how you play the game. This is the sort of thing that Silent Hill does, unlike any other game. It's a masterfully created, fully fleshed out story that deals with very mature themes in the way few games have ever managed, and despite all the cutscenes and the like, it's mainly conveyed through play, never in an unsubtle way, but slowly, surely, as the hooks sink deeper and deeper. Because as I alluded to previously, the game doesn't really tell you much at all. The philosophy, particularly when dealing with psychological horror like this, is that you should never fully know. 
origin stories and backgrounds take away from the mystique, the horror that comes as you think, well, surely it can't be this way, or is it? The state of confusion that creates putting you further on the edge is quite prevalent in films around this time. You can see it in Japanese horror films like Hideo Nakata's Rin. You never know why Sadako even exists in the first place, where those powers come from, and it's kind of a similar story here. Just think of all the things that you don't know. We don't know why the town's in this state. We don't know any of this story behind Pyramid Head. Indeed, we barely know anything about our protagonist, aside from him being here because his dead wife's apparently here. We're not told anything of his background. What does he do? What's his job? Where did he grow up? Who were his parents? We don't know. And personally, I'd keep it that way. It makes you curious, creates a constant state of intrigue and confusion. Whatever little clues you find, people's backstories and whatnot, anything like that is just devoured, as if set upon by a famished dog, purposefully giving you just enough information so that you still don't know, but you still want more and more. I struggled with a lot of this while playing through the game. The effect it had on my psyche was such that I could only ever play it a little bit at a time. So, what do I think Silent Hill is? Is it just an abandoned town, or is it something else? And why is James really here? Why is anyone here? What was the purpose of the whole game in other words? I should say here that this is the only game I've played in the whole series, so I'm kind of unburdened by any origin stories from western developers or things like that, but I came to see Silent Hill as kind of like a mind palace. Not that the place didn't really exist or anything, after all James is not the only person who even comes to Silent Hill. We see others on the journey. There's Angela Owosko, also here and searching for someone, her mother. And where James sees fog, Angela sees flames. The fog for James represents his memory, as he simply refuses to see events for how they really played out. And the fire for Angela represents a constant and nigh intolerable trauma that she desperately wants to extinguish. Everyone sees this place in a slightly different way. There presumably must be a Silent Hill in reality. And perhaps the real Silent Hill is, well, just a perfectly normal resort town, at least on the surface. If you look through the history of all the Silent Hill games, you'll find massive inconsistencies, and I don't think that's a mistake as such. And yet there is something here, a gateway to an alternate world maybe, but we never really know for sure. What I do see is a place that's almost catered for James. As many themes as the game has, the one that always sticks out for me is the grieving process in all of its stages. Denial, sadness, pain, substitutions, punishment, and ultimately just letting go. There's enough ambiguity within the letter and James's memories of his late wife to cast doubts there as to what actually happened, but we can soon decipher that James wants to, in a way, punish himself for what happened. And how is he punished? with one of the greatest and most horrifying creations in the history of the whole genre. In a game where memorable scenes occur so often, perhaps none stick out quite as much as Pyramid Head's introduction. He brutalises two of the game's mannequin-styled monsters as James watches in fear. It's worth noting that in a game filled with mostly feminine-styled monsters, Pyramid Head is one of the few that are wholly, unmistakably masculine. But his style is almost impassive, a walking barrier who represents James's desire to punish himself. Whenever you fight Pyramid Head, you are not actively pursued by him, you only lose if you give in to him. His famous helmet is all scrap metal and sharp edges that almost resemble an executioner's hood, his weapons of choice almost ceremonial implements of judgement, the sort you might find used in a ritual. He is not here to kill James as such, he would only do that if James accepted his punishment. And then there's Maria, who represents James's wish to try and get back what he had with Mary by replacing her with someone who is almost exactly like Mary, albeit appealing more to his, well, more carnal side. Her actions are a lot more charged in that way than anything we see of Mary. And yet if James were to give in to Liz, where would he end up? Idealising a woman in a wholly negative way, turning them into an unattainable image as a coping mechanism, using them almost like a Barbie doll? It wouldn't be too far removed from how Pyramid Head uses those monsters. And so Maria has to be overcome as well, in a sense, at least going by the end in the Tygot. 
Silent Hill's creators have previously mentioned that they were heavily influenced by Alfred Hitchcock in creating Silent Hill, and this is perhaps the greatest example of that. Compare Maria's role here to Kim Novak's role as Madeline in Hitchcock's classic Vertigo, and you'll see what I mean. It covers similar themes. I'm even wondering if it's just a coincidence that James Sunderland and James Stewart share first names and initials. As I mentioned previously, I spent a lot of my time in the game running from monsters. It's what I thought James would do, as I said. But there was, of course, a turning point, when the game makes you one. A seemingly endless corridor, James and Maria chased by a pyramid head. James makes it, but the door closes on Maria, and she is impaled by a spear. James feels wholly responsible for her death, as if he's lost Mary again. I was almost in James's shoes myself, wondering if there was something that I could have done differently. Maybe if I'd turned and started shooting, if I'd faced my fear. But no, there's nothing. The game may want you to feel that way, to feel like James. The last thing he wants to feel is responsible for somebody's death. And Pyramid Head knows this. The town knows this. And so they use Maria again. And again. Another person you meet in the town, Eddie, starts out normal enough, but his mental health slowly degrades as time goes on until he finally turns on James over a perceived slight. It's almost as if the town oversaw this in order to set up a situation where James would be faced with having to take another human being's life, even though, well, as I said, his own recollections of Mary aren't exactly reliable. James is always tested in this way. Do you give in now? Well, how about now? And will you eventually face up to exactly what happened three years ago, James? The answer depends a lot on how you play. After the incident with Maria, my mindset changed, or rather James has did. No more running away from monsters, it's time to take them head on. Building up courage, perhaps. Trying to get to that stage where I could face up to what happened. The final encounter with Pyramid Head, or rather two Pyramid Heads, another one wholly created for James's guilt over what's happened with Maria, it's quite a special moment, the one where James for me accepted what happened. And so Pyramid Head's role became useless, hence why they're not actually killed as such. Instead they kill themselves, as they're no longer needed because James has no further desire to punish himself. It wasn't entirely over there, but I was glad to get the ending that I did, James finally letting go and accepting it all. We get to see the whole of Mary's final letter, and we see James walking off with Laura, the fog having cleared. Laura being a young girl in the town with something of a connection to Mary. Her role is mysterious in that she appears to be in no danger from all the monsters. Do they even see her? Does she see them? She's perhaps the most unaffected of all the characters and perhaps represents the ultimate goal. James and Laura, with the help of each other, can both move on with their lives, with James taking the role of father. Honouring Mary in that way because Laura was, to her, the daughter she couldn't have. I kind of wondered if there might have been a little bit more to this too, but that's one of the great things about the game, that almost anything about it can be picked apart because it's all open to interpretation. And, of course, there is more than one ending. The second time I played through the game, James decided that without Mary in his life, he couldn't live anymore. He took his car and just drove it into the water. There was one ending that ended up fairly positive, all things considered, and another ending that, well, for James may well have ended up positive, but was wholly negative. And perhaps the most beautiful thing about all of that was that it was affected entirely by how I played. When I looked at Angela's knife in the inventory, it almost seemed like I was looking at that knife and examining it and thinking, well, why not? Maybe James could just end it all. Maybe he isn't strong enough. Maybe his mind isn't of that capacity where he could face up to what happened and carry on with his life. It all depends on the tiny littlest things, and that is perhaps the most wonderful thing about the whole game. Just about everything I've mentioned becomes clear through actually playing the game. There are plenty of cutscenes, of course, but they don't drive the story forward as much as gameplay does. Indeed, the cutscenes are often one of the game's weaker points. They're good visually, but the voice acting and script is, well, a little bit stilted, as you'd expect from an early 2000s PS2 game, perhaps. But no, this game is all about storytelling through gameplay. This was a glorious time where the words ludonarrative dissonance didn't really exist, because people were actually doing it. It's kind of a high watermark, really. 
Very few games have reached this standard since. Silent Hill 2 deals with themes that are very hefty, that some would worry about touching at all, but it does so without being unsubtle and without being clumsy and tactless. Going back to Angela's story, the scene where you fight the doorman as she cowers away, it's never spelt out but if you put all the pieces together, well without spoiling it you realise exactly who it is that you're fighting. Again, most games wouldn't dare go near stuff like this, but Silent Hill 2 does so effortlessly and in a very mature way without ever having to hammer it home. Every inch of the game was designed to build on themes and narrative, or to provide a commentary right down to the last detail, from the combat to the puzzles and riddles you have to solve, even down to little things. It's not a coincidence that James finds a handgun inside a shopping cart, and it's not a coincidence that one of the rooms in the apartment just happens to be filled with moths. Hey, why not make a little reference to a film that might have heavily influenced you? Little things like that do so much to make this one of the most rewarding, albeit one of the most emotionally exhausting experiences you can have in all of video games. And of course, there's the horror. The oppression. The things that make every second of this game a serious test. It's not even because it's difficult or anything. Generally speaking, on the normal difficulties, you rarely have much trouble with a fight or with a riddle. They all make sense so long as you take your time and keep on exploring, as you should. Testing out every door, going through every room with a fine tooth comb, all that good stuff. But no, it's a test because of how it's designed. Whenever you enter a new room, you're on edge. Whenever the static gets louder on your radio, you're on edge. Whenever you find anything, you're on edge because you don't yet know what it means, or it's painting another picture. After all, you're just James in the end. Yeah, the movement can be a little clunky, the combat and the ever-changing camera angles can become awkward, but this game wouldn't work as well if it used a more traditional camera. Those Dutch angles, you know, those classic ways of creating tension and confusion, they work so well here. There wasn't any part of this game that didn't have me under a spell, and there were moments, well, yeah. Sometimes I just had to turn the game off because it was too much, and that doesn't happen often. Akira Yamoka's soundtrack too is another pressure point. It features some of the most driving and brilliant rock songs in the history of game music, with Theme of Laura being a particular classic, but it also features sorrowful Rhodes piano, the darkest and trippiest of hip-hop beats, and industrial horror that sounds like an entire row of synthesizers lurching forward and eating themselves. It's one of those soundtracks that couldn't work with anything else. Another shining moment. Another flourish in a game that has them by the hundreds. Very few games have ever quite been as laser focused as Silent Hill 2 is. Very few games can capture a player in that way for every last second. A lot of the things people in games then wish for, games that drive story forward through gameplay, games that deal with mature themes in a sensitive way and so on, Silent Hill 2 achieved that. It's one of the very few that did, and it should be an endless source of inspiration. What more is there to say? It's one of the greatest games from one of the greatest generations. Silent Hill 2 in many ways defines the ceaseless experimentation and creation that defined the PS2 generation, that saw such a wide range of classic and completely new titles coming in such abundance. We haven't seen anything like it before or since. If you've never played it, and you're looking for something special this Halloween, well, this is it. More than just being one of the best horror games, it's one of the best games, full stop. An experience I'll never be able to forget, and it's a story that can't even be compared to other video games. It's virtually on its own. But don't just play it to see a blueprint. Take it all in, and meet the game full on. Immerse yourself. Lose yourself. Lose yourself, and pick up the pieces later. James, you made me happy.